To paraphrase William Shakespeare, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one woman in her time plays many parts. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fourth annual Women's History Month celebration of groundbreaking women. I'm your MC, Maria Noel, Director of African American Business Development at the Chattanooga Area Chamber of Commerce. And we also want to thank you for coming through the snow to be a part of this program. <laughs> Tonight, we will hear inspirational and truly cutting edge stories from five local women. Award-winning author Deborah Levine, HIV activist Candace Taylor, computer pioneer Jenny Strickland Sams, entrepreneur Linda Murray Bullard, and international reporter Millie Smith. Their experiences are as diverse as the phenomenal women who will enter tonight's stage. And throughout their lifetimes, they have too have played many parts and we are truly grateful for their courage, their sacrifices, humility, and persistence. As for their exits, well, welcome to Act Two. To help us honor these five powerhouse women, we have two extraordinary individuals. Prior to coming to Chattanooga, Judy Spiegel distinguished herself as a community leader in Memphis, Tennessee. She was Heart Ball Director for the American Heart Association, volunteer and auctioneer, chair, auction chairperson for the March of Dimes Signature Chefs event, and a fundraising volunteer for the Methodist Labonner Cancer Luncheon for three years. Please join me for a warm Chattanooga welcome to the First Lady of Erlanger Health System, Judy Spiegel, who will introduce the city of Chattanooga's first man, Mayor Andy Burke. Thank you very much, Maria. I really appreciate that great introduction. Mayor Andy Burke knows the value of helping others through giving back to the community. This is a lesson learned early in life from his family and from their law practice. He understands a helping hand as an opportunity to change a life, to provide a sense of hope, and to encourage anyone to aspire to greatness. Andy enjoys the engagement that comes from public service. As a state senator for two terms, he worked on improving the state's role in providing support for education through his work on the Complete College Tennessee Act and First to the Top. He understands that education is a key to future success. The Tennessee PTA and the Tennessee Education Association recognized his work in these areas in 2012. He was elected mayor of Chattanooga one year ago. His first 12 months have set the stage for safer streets, more efficient and effective government, and the creation of more jobs through economic and community development. Prior to his election, he served on the board of the Siskin Children's Institute, WTCI, the community's public television station, the Nature Center, and the Tennessee Holocaust Commission. At his daughter's elementary school, Normal Park Museum Magnet, he has been on the PTA board and a member of the superintendent's parent advisory committee. Andy and his wife, Monique, have two daughters, Hannah and Orly three energetic, talented women, the first family of Chattanooga. Please join me in welcoming to the Women's Groundbreakers 2014 stage our mayor who every day encourages all of us to aspire to reach our potential, Mayor Andy Burke. Thank you, Judy, for that very kind introduction. Uh, what Judy didn't say is that I actually met Kevin and her before they came to Chattanooga when we were in Memphis. I was over there 
uh, at an event, and everybody kept saying, you've got to meet Kevin and Judy. Uh, and so they weren't even here yet. Uh, he hadn't been offered the job here. Uh, I was actually out at his previous hospital, out at Kevin's previous hospital, and, and people were just talking him up. And I have to say, since they've been here, uh, there are no two people who are more energetic and enthusiastic about what's going on in Chattanooga. Uh, we, we all know, particularly as we sit in this hospital, that the success of Erlanger is critical to the future of our community. Um, whether we, if we want to talk about um, some of the things that make sure that people can succeed in this community, access to quality health care is critical to that. And so uh, on behalf of the city, to Judy and to, to Kevin, we certainly appreciate all that you do both for the city and, and for this hospital. Um, I also want to make sure that I say to the uh, American Diversity Group, um, thank you all for putting this on. Um, you know, we have to have these type of events. It's really critical for, for our city. Um, and, and we really do thank you for the work that you put into this. Um, you know, I was thinking as I was coming over here about some of the extraordinary women that I get to meet every day. One of the great things about being mayor is that um, you get to talk to people and they tell you their hopes and their dreams and their aspirations. Um, and, to f and to hear that and to hear their stories as we honor five women today is truly an awesome thing for me to face every day. Yesterday I was at uh, Orchard Knob Middle School and I sat at a table with um, seven, I guess, eighth graders. It turned out they were all women. I don't know why none of the boys wanted to sit with me, but they didn't. Um, and it was extraordinary listening to them because they started out and I said to them, what would you do if you were mayor? Uh, and the, first they started out and they, they gave me all the funny answers that they could about uh, Kool-Aid in the um, in the uh, the water uh, dispensers and everything else, um, and then I said, no, 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 t t tell me for real. What's what are the big issues that you face, and and what is it that that you want? And once we got on a serious topic, it was serious. And to hear them say, we want people to know that we're smart. And we feel like people don't think that we're smart. We want people to know that we can achieve and, and be somebody. We feel like people don't value us. Um, and to hear this come out of their mouths at this table really means something to me. And so as I told them at the table and then I got up and I said, you know, everyone at that table, I could tell from talking to them. You listen to, right, you can get a pretty good sense of people when in a serious conversation what they're like. These were some talented young women. And I'll tell you today what I told them um, yesterday, and I believe in every part of my heart, for us to succeed as a city, we have to nurture and grow everyone's talent. We're not strong enough, none of us, to exclude any group of people and to expect to succeed. That's not the way the world works. That's not the way modern society works. There was a time, it's hard to believe in our country, where we did that systematically with lots of different groups of people and said, you're not allowed to participate in the society. Now, today we, we, we look down on that and we say, how can that be? But the truth of the matter is that we have to go farther and to make sure that we are not just saying these barriers don't exist, but actually invite people in and give them opportunities to succeed and participate. Um, you know, I think about uh, Ruth Holmberg who I got to honor a week or two ago, uh, has this extraordinary life in, in Chattanooga and the great things that she's accomplished. Um, but then I also think about Katarina Gilbert, and I'm not sure how many of y'all have uh, gotten the opportunity to see the documentary about her, uh, but here she is. We've got this documentary that Maria Shriver did about HBO and women who live paycheck to paycheck struggling with their families. And so we know that for us to be all that we can be as a city, we have to have the Ruth Holmbergs of the world. They are extraordinary, have done incredible things for us over the course of decades. You also have to make sure that the Katarina Gilberts of the world um, have a life in which 
they can succeed knowing that they have the drains on them that, that they have every day. Um, this, is, this is the tale of, of what a city is like. This is how we succeed as a city, by having events like this, by talking about the real stories that people face. Just want to make sure that I mention um, one more uh, before we move on to, to this evening's activities. Uh, last week we had our first call-in uh, of the new Chattanooga Violence Reduction Initiative. This is an extraordinary situation where we actually invite in people who are members of some of the most violent groups in our community and we say to them, this is unacceptable and it's not going to happen anymore. Uh, we have community members talk to them, law enforcement, and, and uh, I got a chance to say a few words and say, here are the new parameters for the way our city works. It was an incredible night. The most amazing, most amazing part of all this, most amazing part of this night was we have 13 people there, um, young, all young men, um, who were, again, part of these groups. And uh, a woman of extraordinary courage was there who had lost her son a little bit under a year ago, who was 20 years old, uh, to gunshots on the porch. She told the story of what it was like for her to, to lose her son and then walked up to each of these 13 young men and said, you could have been my son. Now only, uh, th this was a moment that, that a mother and literally all these 13 boys thought that they were her son for that moment. Incredible, incredible. We're gonna honor five, five women here tonight. Uh, the stories are each unique. They are all different, but by the same token, what I'm here to say on behalf of the city of Chattanooga is they're all valued. And as we move forward as a city, uh, we have to continue to find ways as a community to make sure that everybody has the chance to write their own story in Chattanooga. Thank you very much. At this time, we want to thank Mrs. Spiegel and Mayor Burke, um, and as a Chattanooga native, that was, those were amazing comments to hear from the mayor. Uh, we also want to thank our generous sponsors whose support helped make tonight's celebration possible. Our platinum sponsors are American Diversity Report, Women's Council on Diversity, Accolade, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, the Chattanooga Area Chamber of Commerce, Erlanger Health System, Accelerant. Our gold sponsors are Chattanooga Cares, Communication VIP, 312 Creative. And we'd also like to give a special thanks to our community partners, Girls Preparatory School and Girls Inc. of Chattanooga. These future groundbreakers created videos that will be featured on our site throughout Women's History Month and throughout the remainder of the year. And please make sure you visit our site at womengroundbreakers.com. And now for the moment we've all been waiting for, the telling of their stories. Our first honoree is no stranger to the stage. She is the founder of and visionary behind the Women's History Month celebration. The groundbreaker celebration, not just Women's History Month, but <laughs> even though Deborah has done amazing things. Deborah Levine is an award-winning author, cross-cultural expert, and Huffington Post religion blogger. With degrees in cultural anthropology and urban planning, her writing about diversity spanned decades with articles published in the American Journal of Community Psychology, the Journal of Public Management and Social Policy, and the Harvard Divinity School Bulletin. Her most recent book, Going Southern, The No Mess Guide to Success in the South, is featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. As the creator of the American Diversity Report and Women's Council on Diversity, Deborah continues to provide programming, 
training and presentations on our growing Southern global connection. She also serves on Volkswagen's Diversity Advisory Council. Here's Deborah Levine with what broken bones and breaking ground have in common. I'm going to do my story today with my broken arm in a sling. I had a kerfuffle with the floor at a department store and the floor won. And as I lay there looking up at the ceiling, all I could think of was how am I going to get everything done for women groundbreakers? I'm sure everyone could hear me muttering throughout the store, we're doomed. But then again, the broken bone factor makes it all the more interesting. And this is a broken bone, yes. It is not a disability as much as I say that since I haven't driven in three months, but it is not. It is interesting. And it is not the first time in which I have done major programming with a broken bone. Years ago, I was sitting in my Chicago office. I had just survived three years of planning the National Conference on Christian-Jewish Relations, an international conference. And I was staring at the cast on my foot. And I said to said cast, I hope you're ready for the marathon that this conference is, because it has every controversial issue known to mankind. Right? church-state conflicts, international wars, ordination of women, life and death. How am I going to do this? Of course, I muttered to my leg, we're doomed. But the planning committee created the most incredible religious diversity conference I have ever seen. Thank you, planning committee. Maybe broken bones and breaking ground go together. Who knows? Despite the success, however, I was looking forward to turning the page. I was going to create a sweet interfaith network in the suburbs of Chicago, DuPage County, work from home, use my very first computer set up in my own kitchen, and see my beautiful daughter a little more. Yes, I was going to lay down my sword and shield by the Chicago Riverside Drive and do war no more. And then I opened up the Chicago Tribune and on the front page, on the top of the fold, in glorious technicolor, were hundreds of teenagers who had taken to the streets, shouting and shoving and making rude gestures as teenagers do, then joined by police and then joined by, it looked like my neighbors. Yes, my hometown in DuPage, had imploded over an issue of the Christmas tree removal in the local high school. Then I looked at the cast on my foot and I said, of course, we're doomed. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but so many years later, the DuPage Interfaith Resource Network created a path for peace through some of the most difficult, noisy years of my life. Two books later, 21 years of diversity Thanksgiving programming, and there was a path to peace for communities. I thank my planning committee, my advisory committee, especially my advisory chair, Sister Marge Boyle. Marge, who knew that the 25 years before you became a Catholic nun and was project director for NASA would come in quite so handy. Well, this time I figured I really know this groundbreaking stuff. I could go after it on purpose. And so I took the job of media and community liaison for the Tulsa Jewish Federation shortly after the bombing of the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City. I wanted to see firsthand what domestic terrorism looked like. I wanted to be in the seats for the trial of the bomber Timothy McVeigh. Now, it's true that eventually that trial went out of state, but 
the issues didn't go away. And I found that out after I got my first notice that uh, someone would like to break my bones for me. And yes, I was trained by the FBI in um, terrorist uh, counterterrorism procedures, and I was going national with a story of a local neo-Nazi hotline being run out of someone's home in Tulsa. And yes, I muttered, we're doomed quite a bit, but the planning committee of the Oklahoma Say No to Hate Coalition propped me up and helped me through it all. Thank you, Coalition, always. But I figured it was time to, for going Southern, for sweet smiles, sweet smelling flowers, just like back home when I grew up in Bermuda. And so I came to become the executive director of the Jewish Federation here to build a new cultural center. And there I was, you can picture it, sitting with the architect at the Big River Street, Big River Grill, having a lovely lunch, planning a huge monumental building for the cultural center that would rival the glass of the aquarium. And all of a sudden, on the television comes a breaking news story of the bombing of a California Federation. And you could see the, little, the police lead the little preschoolers out single file to safety across the street. Hmm. We immediately scratched all the glass and went to something secure. I hadn't broken anything, but better safe than sorry, right? And I didn't mutter, we're doomed until later, when I was on a mission to Uzbekistan, to Tashkent in Uzbekistan, and became so ill that I could not continue as executive director. Oh, I was so sorry. And I called some of my women friends, new Southerners and diverse Southerners alike, to put together a lovely, sweet network that would do programming, educational programming, in a lovely setting in Chattanooga. And we called a committee meeting for September 12th, 2001. No, I did not call it for the day after 9-11 on purpose. And yes, the next years were wild and crazy with global leadership classes and youth multicultural video contests the AmericanDiversityReport.com, and of course, Women Groundbreakers. I have not muttered, we're doomed very long with this because of the committee that we have to produce this. So look in your program and you'll see the wonderful people who helped me do this. Thank you, always. Now bring on the groundbreaking. That was amazing. Memphis native Candace Taylor received her Bachelor of Science in Electronic Media Management from Bragg College of Mass Communication at Middle Tennessee State University. Candace began her community work in Texas, helping underprivileged students obtain their GEDs and enroll in college. Responding to Tennessee's need, Candace raised funds for St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis. She is currently Community Relations Manager at Chattanooga Cares, where she builds bridges to end stigmas and educate women about HIV, AIDS, safe practices, and life decisions. Candace also serves as Assistant Secretary for Hamilton County's NAACP branch and as a Chattanooga Chamber Ambassador. Thank you, Candy. <laughs> She's also a member of Volkswagen's Diversity Council and the Southeast Tennessee Development District's HIV Council. Advocate Candace Taylor will give us her portrait of inspiration. Thank you so much, Maria. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to Ms. Deborah Levine for having me at this awesome event. The Planning Committee, 
for all the hard work that you guys have done. And thank you so much for these beautiful women for allowing me to share the stage with them. It's such an honor. Thank you so much. Um, today, I am here only as a number, a statistic of those who are an at-risk population, or more simply, just a statistic. Today, I am telling you a story of one woman, many women, that have fought battles daily and stories that go untold. Today, unfortunately, this is the story of many women. When I was a girl, I would dream that I could have love and happiness, and for my world would become so rose-colored and beautiful. But for me, it only collapsed. For years, I saw refuge in drugs because I thought that it was the only way to eliminate my frustrations, but it only got worse. I began to wander the streets without bathing, sleeping only when I passed out. I ate out of trash cans. I was living in such despair. I was such a young girl and I was so alone. People judge me. They don't know me. They don't know that I've literally been screwed, you guys, since I was four. I don't know when I contracted HIV, but I was diagnosed in prison. When I got out of prison after six months, my partner helped me to realize that I was becoming a public nuisance. And I needed to change or I was gonna go back to prison and I didn't wanna go there. So she was right, I got clean. I was sent to prison again. <laughs> but I took advantage of that time to prepare myself mentally and to prepare myself physically because I knew that I had a better life to build. When I was released, I went right to the free clinic up the street and I saw a doctor who helped me with my HIV. My doctor, my best friend, and my partner were the ones who helped me take care of myself because they knew that I had a son to take care of. And that was my only determination. But it was my determination that kept me from a life of drugs and crime after that. And without all of these people's support, I would have never found myself. This is a story of a 29-year-old woman that's living in America, maybe even in your neighborhood, might be in my neighborhood. But the story is one of women across America who fight to stay above ground, grounds that they believe to have been broken. Their children out here looking for love in all the wrong places because their mothers are absent at that time, creating a, a, a vicious circle that repeats itself throughout their family trees. This is not my story, but it is the story of women across America. My work is never done. The disparities in the communities, especially in the African American community, are so far beyond of what you and I could expect, you probably couldn't imagine. So let me paint a picture for you. So nationally, 1.1 million people are living with HIV. Every nine and a half minutes, someone new is infected. In Tennessee, African Americans, they make up 17% of the Tennessee population, yet 62% of the new diagnosis in 2012. Why? I don't know. That's what a young, hot, single, young, professional like myself, shameless plug, <laughs> asks myself every day, why? It, it, it could be stigma, it could be poverty, it could be a lack of health care, could be fear, it could be homophobia could be a lack of love. So, you wondering how this lady's story ends? So, I returned to New York feeling motivated and optimistic, but I still hadn't accepted the fact that I have HIV. Shortly after I was hospitalized with an infection and I started going through HIV therapy, you guys, and I, and I noticed that I was shaken and I needed help. I stopped taking my medication because it scared me. I, I didn't know, I, I, I thought I was doomed to die. Eventually, my doctor said, you are going to die if you keep up this behavior. The words shook me so I realized I had a choice. I either had to find it and stay motivated, give myself a second chance, give myself a fighting chance. No one has to sink as low as I did before confronting their HIV. There's so much help and support out here that I had so much to live for. What I didn't tell you is that all five of my children had been taken away from me before I went to prison. So I am here to tell you that there is an, opportun an opportunity after preservation. So many challenges and mistakes before, I've had to take control of my life and my disease, and I hope that other women can learn from me because 
after all these years of special of trouble struggle especially what i've been through you don't have to wait so long to try to get help these are the stories of other women but they're not mine maybe in your culture maybe in mine but as women we share struggles and triumphs with which makes us beautiful and we share them with each other pointing fingers and, and, and taking blame. It's like tossing salad or tossing pizza if you prefer that visual. But I know that it's my social responsibility to educate. This is how I break ground. Educate the young, educate the old, educate parents, educate the one that knows everything. You can imagine how hard that is. Because one day, one person will tell me thank you. Now my story started out as a, as a decoy for, for African American men that needed to take their time to, um, to, to tell their parents that didn't quite know how to come out and almost all of those young men that I knew have passed away from HIV. So I hope that my story can help you guys. Thank you. Atlanta-born Jenny Strickland Sams specializes in computers, where she worked for railroads and trucking companies at a time when few women were in those industries. A true pioneer, she was involved in the historic computerization of the Southern Railroad. Today, she is a writer, poet, and spoken word performer. Jenny serves on the Trenton, Georgia Arts Council, the Dade County Library Board of Directors, and she performs locally and internationally in Zimbabwe, Costa Rica, and Mexico. Trailblazer Jenny Strickland Sams is on track with the Southern Railway. Thank you, Maria. And welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out through the sun shining, snowstorm, wind <laughs> that we had tonight. This is the 21st century, but if you don't mind, I'd like to take you on a brief journey back to 1963. That's the year when Southern Railway hired me as their first woman computer programmer. Now, in 1963, most women were not expected to work at all. But for those of us that did want to work, there were a limited number of jobs. The help wanted was separated into help wanted men on the right, help wanted women on the left. And the jobs for women were teachers, waitresses, nurses, stewardesses, and that was about it. Well, when it occurred to me that I would really like to be a computer programmer, I went to the guidance counselor at Georgia State University and asked, well, what are the qualifications to be a, a computer programmer? That really appeals to me. He said, oh, Jenny, I, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but you do not qualify. I was very naive. I said, well, what, what are the qualifications? Well, you have to be a man. Well, why? because computer programming requires logic. <laughs> now, I had done well in my logic class, so I was logical enough to know that logic was not restricted to just men only. So I thanked him and called IBM and asked them the same question. They brought me in, and to make a long story short, they gave me a logic test, apparently I did well on it. They sent the results to Southern Railway and Southern Railway hired me as their first woman computer programmer. Now there were also two other reasons why they hired, took the chance, and this was a big chance that they were taking to hire a woman computer programmer. One was because they had in the past only hired programmers from within the company and they kind of run out of people working for the railroad who had that geeky mindset that does enable you to think like a computer programmer. But the more important reason is that they had just hired Jack Jones 
to head up the data processing department. Jack Jones was in the Navy at the time, about to retire and move into private industry. And in the Navy, he was on the committee working with Commander Grace Hopper, who is the woman who recognized the need to develop a computer programming language that would work with any computer, any operating system, any brand. So he knew for a fact that there was at least one woman on the planet who could think like a computer programmer and had a vision for the future. And who knows, there might be two. Well, I started in 1963. My first assignment was to convert the Interfreight accounting system from the old computer, the 1401, to their brand new, sophisticated, state-of-the-art IBM 705. The IBM 705 would have filled half of this room, literally, wall to wall, half the room. It had huge bulbs in it. It used tapes and uh, cards, and the day that I showed up at work, the computer was down because a mosquito had crawled into the inner workings and caused a short circuit. So when you hear people talk about a computer bug, well, in 1963, those were actual insects. Now, in spite, in, in spite of the fact that this was a huge state-of-the-art computer, it didn't come anywhere near the capability that you have on the cell phone that's in your pocket. Seriously. But the first six months I spent converting this inter freight accounting program from the 1401 to this new language. Now, colleges at the time didn't teach computer programming because, again, the very few companies had computers. Most computers in the, on the planet at, in 1963 were in use for the military or government science agencies, or a few uh, colleges. And the professors at those colleges thought, well, this is a certain mindset that some people can think about being programmers and others cannot. How can you teach that? Well, six, six months later, I'd figured it all out. I'd converted the Interfreight accounting system to the new accounting system. My boss took me aside. He promoted me. And he also informed me that I had been an experiment, that they had taken a really big chance on me as the first woman programmer, not only that, one without a railroad experience, but as a result of my success, all of a sudden there was an influx of lots of college graduates, men and women both, coming to work for the railroad as programmers. 12 years later, I was still there. I thought I'd always loved being a computer programmer, but it turned out that I'd reached the point where I wasn't programming much. I was mostly advising other programmers, helping them with problems, solving design issues, mentoring new people. I thought maybe it's time for me to move into management. Well, to make a long story short, Southern Railway was ready for women programmers, but they weren't ready for women managers. So I left the railroad, went to work as a manager at Watkins Motor Lines, once again a male-dominated transportation industry. A few months later I was promoted from manager to director, and then I got a phone call from friends at the railroad saying that after I left, the management team recognized the mistake they'd made and they promoted three of my women colleagues to be computer programming managers. So it all made a difference. But one thing that I've realized, I, all my career I thought of myself as being a feminist. A feminist. And women, young women today sort of discount that name. They don't want to claim feminism. It has finally come to my awareness that this was never all about women. It was about creating opportunities that were gender negative. So men and women both now can be managers, lawyers, doctors, nurses, flight attendants, waiters, waitresses, anything that is, fits our talent and our desire. So I love the name that Deborah gave this meeting. It's not about feminism, it's about groundbreaking. Welcome back to the 21st century.
Linda Murray Bullard is Erlanger Health System's Contract Process Coordinator. She previously worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee for more than two decades. Linda earned a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from Bryan College, is certified by the Project Management Institute, and is a Six Sigma Yellow Belt. Her book, The Well Ran Dry, Memoirs of a Motherless Child, was recently accepted into the Library of Congress's General Collection. Linda, who uses her book and her life story to educate others on the power of choice, also facilitates an adult entrepreneur class for Lunch of Chattanooga, a nonprofit organization that provides business training opportunities in several of Chattanooga's underserved communities. Linda also is the owner of LSMB Business Solutions, LLC, a business consulting firm. Here's motivator Linda Murray Bullard with This Woman's Life Has Many Chapters. Hello everyone. You clapped for me. You welcomed me. You accepted me. That means a lot to me. I have worked hard for these four uh, 54 years and I have been trying to advance and be all that I can be but I ha cannot go forward without going back you see my mind goes back to nine years old and my dad comes in and he says mama's not coming home anymore it's Christmas Day is gray it's cold and mama's not coming home anymore processing that in my nine-year-old self what I heard was, mama's not coming back from the store. Mama's not coming back from downtown paying bills. In my nine-year-old mind, mama left, but mama always came back home. I, the next few days were up and down, many people, many places, a lot to do. And I remember people coming in, helping my father process my mother's loss and say, oh, she won't remember, she's only nine. But I stand before you here today telling you I do remember. I remember their faces. I remember those conversations. I was nine, but I wasn't dead. Fast forward four years, and I'm sitting in a health class at Eastside Junior High School. And they're telling us as young ladies how babies are made. You see, that story was relevant for me because had I heard it five months ago, I could have applied it. But imagine everything you've learned since you were nine from your mother, and you'll see my deficit in learning. Everything I learned about being a woman, I learned from a stranger, a kind stranger, someone who embraced my loneliness, someone who saw the voids in my life but not my mother. I have my son and I'm in the hospital and he's out and I'm looking at the first time acceptance. You see, when you're without your mother, people look at you with pity. When you're without, when you're pregnant, they look at you with disgust. To walk, not just from strangers, I mean from family members, from doctors, from teachers, from everybody in the world, in their mind, you, are a bad girl. However, what they fail to understand is my backstory is I was still trying to learn how to be a girl. So when I was four months pregnant, I learned how I got pregnant because miseducation is just as bad as no education at all. Nine years old, 13 years old, 14 years old, I had my son and I told my son on the day he was born, you are a leader. And every day of his life, from that day to this one, he will be 40 in May. And I tell him, you are a leader. My son has a 16-year career at the Chattanooga Fire Department. His, his daughter graduated Emory University. What I do in my groundbreaking is I've sat at the table at amazing people. I've been to amazing places. I've done a lot of things. 
But along my way, my journey only begins when I break ground from a little girl who's 13 to 19 years old and she's going through maternity and she feels like people think that in her 13 through 19 body, 13 through 19 year old body, that her mind is 25 to 30 years old and she can make a difference and she can sort through it and she can make it better. My groundbreaking will come when on September the 20th, I host the first ever in this city, a teen mom empowerment conference for up to 150 of Chattanooga's children. Because my groundbreaking starts when I make it better for someone else. My name is Linda Murray Buller. I'm all those things Maria said, but before all those things, I was motherless, and I was a teen mom. Dr. Maya Angelou penned it best in defining phenomenal women like these. Now you understand just why their heads are not bowed. They don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see them passing, it ought to make you proud. Just say, it's in the click of their heels, the bend of their hair, the palms of their hands, the knee for their care. Cause these are women, phenomenally, phenomenal women. That's Deborah Levine, Candace Taylor, Jenny Strickland Sands, Linda Murray Bullock, and Millie Smith. And now for another phenomenal woman, here's Erlanger Health Systems Diversity Officer Elizabeth Appling, who will award prizes and conclude tonight's program. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Isn't this, wasn't this a great program? Let's give all the ladies, stand up ladies. Please stand up. You guys are so wonderful. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, this is the time of the program where we are going to have a drawing. Did everyone uh, turn in their raffle ticket? Did everybody turn theirs in? Okay, you have some more. you to pull or we got we're going to raffle off a $25 Amazon gift card and the winner of the gift card six nine five five six zero that person here is or do I take this home with me <laughs> six nine five five six zero Woo, okay in the back we have a winner in the back. Angela, do you mind? Okay, and then we have our second card. Let's see. For $25 also. Oops, that's probably somebody's card. Let me do another one. Uh-oh. I'm sorry, Angela. You said I made you bend down. Uh, 695565. All right, Woo. thank you. Now, some of our storytellers, would you come up? Because they have uh, gifts to give away. Vincent Phipps, would you come down, please? Did you bring a book that you'd like to give away at this time? Well, you could, uh, why don't they just come to the table and pick it up after you pull a winner? And tell us a little bit about your book, uh, Vincent. And about Hello, your, your company. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the name of the company is called Education VIP. If you 
that he or my initials makes an IV dips. He does not fear for the parents to initially give the IV to the state of freshman program. <laughs> With the BIP stands for Brain Port People Skills, I teach Hassan Team World Ball Presentation, Public Speaking Ability. The books are called Talk Tips by Ben Flips. Each has a book that is now more powerful to give professional accolades that you deserve. All right, thank you. That was unrehearsed, by the way. Oh. <laughs> And the winner is 695573. 695573. She put hers in the basket, so you, yeah, that's her season. Woo! So she won. All right. And Devi, I'm not going to try to pronounce Devi's last name. Devi, would you come up, please? Because I know that you have something that you would do. Oh, you no, talk I, about your company a little yes. bit? Um, would, would you? Yeah. Our company is Accolade. We're a leadership and communication development company. Um, we have some upcoming workshops in May, July, and September. Um, Deborah Levine, our luminary, is uh, teaching one of the workshops on May 7th, cultural adaptation. Mm -hmm. And we are giving away one workshop. All right. Yeah. And that is six nine five five seven four. Oh, Great. Right. <laughs> I know. Wait a minute now. All right. All right. Uh, Sue, would you come up, please, and tell us a little bit about your company? And you're also. Uh, did I give your prizes away already, or you have something? I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> but tell us a little bit about your company. My company is Accelerate, and we are a project management company. Uh, we like to take on long-term projects where we come in and go from training through the end of the project, working hand-in-hand -hand with our customers. So, all okay. mm -hmm. Thank you. And I gave away the two Kindle cards for Sue. And I think some of our storytellers, um, I know that Linda is giving away a copy of her book. Would you come and do the honors, please? I like the little story. I know, right? <laughs> and the winner is number 695584. Oh, right across, almost close. No. Who is the thought it was? Eight four? Six nine five five eight four? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Should we just qualify right. him or not? <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone else has do you have anything? Okay. Deborah. <laughs> While she's coming up, I do want to. Uh, you want one more? One more yeah, one more thing. Okay. Um, I'm rushing, guys. That's all right. <laughs> we added this at the last minute. So yes. This will be a surprise to some people. Uh -oh. uh, but uh, I, I am, am so honored to, to work with this wonderful committee. Thank you all, of course, but also our storytellers. And so we have.
Now we're ready. Okay. Well, this concludes our program for tonight, and I can't thank uh, storytellers enough, and thank all of you for coming out. We did have a little snowstorm today. <laughs> yeah, you know, we everything shuts down in Chattanooga. But on behalf of Erlanger Health Systems uh, Diversity Program and um, Deborah Levine, editor author of American Diversity Report. We want to thank you all for coming out tonight and look forward to next year, guys. It's going to be even bigger and better. So thank you all for coming out tonight. There's still food out in the lobby, guys.